So now that we understand a little bit about remote desktop, we also need to understand that we can remote desktop to any server, whether it has its own hardware or whether it's using shared hardware on a virtual platform. Let's take that a step further and talk a little bit about virtualization. Virtualization means in its purest form, we're running Hyper-V and we have all of our servers and little virtual consoles. Now we can take virtualization a little bit further. We can virtualize apps and we also have other enterprise versions of being able to virtualize. So we'll talk about some of your options, but really focus mostly on what's on server 2012 natively. And of course, that's Hyper-V. So to talk about Hyper-V, this is a virtualization role that you add to server 2012. The hardware requirements are really not too high, but what I like to make sure you're clear on is to install the Hyper-V role itself is absolutely nothing. However, once you start adding virtual machines, you better have the processor, the disk space, and the memory to handle what it is you're asking it to do. So the role itself doesn't take very much, it's the stuff you add after that you get a plan for. But in order to install the Hyper-V role, you want to make sure that you're on an x64 platform. You want to make sure that that platform, the hardware itself, supports SLAT and DEP, or DEP. Now, those are the pieces that are going to be built into the hardware and the motherboard and the processor cores to make sure that it knows how to deal with a virtual environment. You need an absolute minimum of 4 gigs of RAM. I'll tell you right now, if I'm running a full server 2012 with Hyper-V roll and 4 gigs of RAM, that's going to be enough to turn it on, log in, and maybe start creating virtual machines. But once those machines start running, you're just going to be out of memory. Now, again, that's going to bring us back to make sure you plan not for the Hyper-V role, but for the servers that you add on to it. Now, the server resources that are taken are different in a virtual world than in a physical world. So if I have a physical server with 8 gigs of RAM, I might be able to virtualize it at 4 gigs. So make sure you do your homework and you do a little bit of performance testing before you make those decisions. Add up everything you're going to put on it, and now you'll know what your hardware requirements are. Make sure you look at CPU, memory, disk space, and of course your network throughput, because it's all about networking. We had mentioned application virtualization. Now this is known as an app v client. Now if you're looking for an app v client, it is not native to server 2012, but it's actually part of the Microsoft desktop optimization pack. So it's something that you can go ahead and install and configure. Again, separate subject, but just to put it in its place if you've heard of it. So again, not a native roller feature, it's something you download with the optimization pack. And what it does is it allows you to isolate applications from the operating system and then stream them out. We also have the Microsoft Enterprise Desktop Virtualization. Now if you have a large volume of users who are accessing the legacy operating systems, it does allow you to centrally manage them. Now again, I have a lot of clients that basically run a miniature Hyper-V, and we'll leave it that way because we're not in a workstation class, and that allows them to access the older legacy apps. Well, based on that, we want to make sure that if there's 400 of them, that you don't have administrators trying to maintain it 400 separate times. So it allows them to centrally deploy and manage those virtual machines on the client workstations themselves. And again, this is not native to Server 2012, but it is available in the Desktop Optimization Pack. What happens when you run a virtual server is it's running in its own little space. Now, for someone who's brand new to this, I guess the analogy, which is as close as I can come up with, is it's just like opening up Microsoft Word. You open up Word, everything you do within that window is 100% Microsoft Word. What's going on on the rest of the computer has nothing to do with that application, meaning it's isolated and you open it and there are certain functions you do in that application. Well, virtualization is much, much bigger than that because you're actually virtualizing an entire machine. But when you remote over to it to manage it, it opens up in a window, just like any other application, and within that window you have everything you would have as if you were sitting in front of it. 
Now, if you're a network-based application like Exchange or SQL or a file server or a print server, then you don't have to connect to, to administrate it. Essentially, it's sitting on the network like any other piece of hardware doing what it has got to do. So when you create the virtual machines, what it does is it simulates all the hardware that they need to run. So the server thinks it has its own BIOS, it has its own memory pool, it's got processors, it's got two IDE controllers, IDE 0 and 1. It has a SCSI controller that you can emulate, a network adapter. It can emulate COM 1 and 2, and even a floppy drive if you are so inclined that you forgot those even existed. So this is the base hardware that you get that's emulated for this virtual machine, but you can add up to four more SCSI controllers. You can add network adapters so that you can put a server on more than one network. You can add what is known as a legacy network adapter. We're going to talk more about that later because there's some pretty neat stuff about it. Your fiber channel adapter or even a remote FX video adapter. So all of these you can add on top of what it already thinks it has. And again, there's a couple cool things about the legacy adapter that we will talk about. Once you have Hyper-V Manager configured as a role the way it needs to work from hardware management right through to your virtual networks, now you're ready to go ahead and start creating virtual machines. Now remember, there's no official limit to virtual machines. Your limits are going to be um, really formed based on the hardware that you're installing or install behind this whole server that's hosting the Hyper-V role. So I'm going to right click and I'm going to choose new. My choices are virtual machine, hard disk, or floppy disk. Now you can create these independently and then you can attach them to virtual machines. So an example, if you want to create a base hard drive, that has files that you might use in more than one scenario, then you can create that hard drive, configure it, put things on it, and then essentially attach it. So here I'm going to go ahead and hit virtual machine. So again, if you're new with VMs, just make sure you read every single screen. You may have already done all your homework, but you might see something in here to make sure that, that reminds you of something you've literally forgotten. So. I'm going to go ahead and hit next. I've got to choose a name. So you have to have a naming convention. Like anything else, the more organized you are, the easier it is to decipher. Now, again, this obviously depends on the environment. I've gone in environments where there's one or two servers and they share everything. At that point, it's more about knowing your network. I have one network that I manage that is nothing but animal names, usually big cats. So I have another one that's over Camelot. So it's all names that remind you of Camelot from Merlin to King Arthur. So in those environments, because the servers usually share roles and there's not quite as many, that type of convention works. But if you're dealing with a larger network, if you're dealing with a multi-domain network, if you're dealing with more than one site, meaning it's not a nice, neat little package all in one little um, area of a shared office space, then you really want to think about how you name your machines. Now, we're going to take the assumption here that we have a, a domain that we're working on, and that domain, of course, is going to be Sandra Classroom, but that we also have more than one site. So based on that, you want to somehow mix in what domain it belongs to. Again, it might be a multi-domain environment. You want to go ahead and somehow name an operating system, and you might want to name a purpose. So I'm going to put a couple of different ideas here. And again, you have to look at your network and how big or small it is, how many physical sites, how many domains, in terms of what you actually put in there. So if I had a single domain named Sandra Classroom, but I span two sites, it wouldn't be as important for me to know the name of the domain, because it's always the same, it would be important for me to know when this, where this server was. So in this case, this might be the main site for Sandra Classroom, and then I put a notation so I know the operating system version. I'm going to go ahead and delete that. If it was a multiple domain environment, I might do the domain first. I might do the site second. 
I might do the OS next, so maybe this will be server core, and if there was a point to this, meaning what roles would this actually host, I might put the roles. So if you're maintaining 100 or 200 servers, you could look at that name instantly and know the domain, the site, the OS, and what it's hosting automatically just by looking at the name. And as long as you're consistent through the entire network, you'll find that that model works just fine. You always want to assign memory. Now, think through how much memory the physical machine has. Think through how much memory the virtual machines that all have to run at the same time is, and it's just really simple math. You can't use more memory than you have. Now, it will go ahead and try to give you some amount of memory that it would recommend, and also keep in mind that virtual machines take a lot less memory than physical machines. So this is going to be the startup memory, 512 megabytes. Now, you want to specify anything from 8 meg all the way through to 14. You want to specify more than minimum, and again, this is just what it's going to start up with. So I'm going to go ahead and say this could be a whole gig, or better yet, if I think through what I'm saying, this is server core, so maybe for server core that's going to be enough. So it's a little bit of planning. Changing the amount of memory is pretty easy because all you have to do is shut down the machine, allocate a different amount of RAM, and then boot it right back up. You have to have the virtual machine connected to a network adapter. If you've already been through the switches when you set up Hyper-V, you set up the networks that you'd be able to do. So this could either be on a live network or it could be in the segregated lab network. For now, we'll go ahead into the live network. So here's our name. Here's the location. Notice the size of the hard drive. Now again, you are going to be limited to how many gigs of hard drive space will be needed for the machines that are running. But even with the machines that are running, you still have to store these virtual machine files, and they are quite large. I happen to know for server core, I don't need that much. So for now, I'm just going to stick with 50 gig, especially in a lab environment. Now again, if you've already created virtual hard drives, you can use them. You can attach it later, so you can just set up these pieces. But I'm going to go ahead and hit next. I can install an operating system later. Again, setting up the core, coming back to it later because it's too close to lunch. We can go ahead and install an operating system from a boot CD or DVD-ROM. So notice here, I can do the physical CD or DVD if there was one in the bay. Or I can go here to the image file, and I can go out, and if I had an ISO, I could find it and attach to it as if it was a physical CD. For now, I'm going to go ahead and install this later. I'll click on Next, and I'll click on Finish. And you'll see now the virtual machine. There's my server core. It's off. And if it was up and running, I would see that it was started in any of the resources that it happens to be using. When you're working with Hyper-V, you have to plan like anything else before you come in here. Now, there are three important places in Hyper-V. One of them is the Hyper-V settings, which are basically your defaults for anything that you're creating. You also have the virtual switches, which is where your network settings go, and, of course, your virtual storage area network. So you've got to think about where things are going, how they're going to be networked, and, of course, set your defaults. We're going to take a look at the Hyper-V settings. And this is to show you that we have our virtual hard drives. By default, they go into public. But you may have a C drive with minimal space for an operating system, and you're using space on a different drive for everything else. So make sure so that you don't have to change it each and every time, that you change the default here. So these are where the virtual hard drives are. The virtual hard disks actually take the most amount of space, so you want to plan that carefully. The virtual machines themselves, which are more configuration files, need to be something that are high performance, like anything else, but they do take a lot less space, so you can separate these. You have your physical GPUs are spanning, 
and this is to span our non-uniform memory architecture, otherwise known as NUMA. And again, if you have these NUMA nodes because you're sharing hardware, you can configure them here. Whether or not you want live migrations, when you add the Hyper-V role, this is a question that you answer. My statement is, you can always come back and change your mind later. What are you going to do about storage migrations or replication? And of course, these are all server-based defaults. Your user defaults are keyboard, what are you going to use? The one on the physical computer, the one on the virtual machine. Now again, these keyboards, when I say keyboard, it's more of the keyboard shortcuts. So if you'll notice, most of the defaults previous to this was physical computers. So you do a Control-Alt-Delete, it's going to reboot the host machine, not the actual virtual machine. So just decide how you want that to work. If by chance the mouse is stuck within a Hyper-V window, how is it that you would like to release it? Again, you can go ahead and choose your shortcuts. And what about reset checkboxes? If you really want to make sure that everything's reset, just kind of clean it up and put it the way it's supposed to be. Here you go. So these are your Hyper-V settings. Understand they are server-based defaults and how you, as a user interacting with the machines, would like everything to work.